right. My name is Britt Nahorny. I'm a master's student in Dr. Islam's lab. I'm going to be speaking about my thesis research tonight on the diet and gut microbiome of cerulean warblers in southern Indiana and the relationship between breeding phenology and caterpillar abundance. My presentation has two parts. In the first part, I'm going to focus on dietary patterns and nest stages and caterpillar availability. And then in the second part of my presentation, I'm going to switch over to my research on the gut microbiome. So the study of avian diets is essential to understanding tropic interactions and prey choice dynamics. And diet composition can fluctuate, especially over the course of a breeding season, as prey availability changes. And currently, we're seeing rapid losses of invertebrate populations worldwide due to light pollution, pesticides, habitat loss, and climate change. And the majority of songbirds in North America consume moths during the breeding season. And this loss of invertebrate populations is restructuring food webs and also uh, fueling a decline in insectivorous bird species. Cerulean warblers are a neotropical migrant that breed in hardwood forests in Indiana, including in, also in the Midwest. And cerulean warblers have foraging preferences for white oaks, hickories, and sugar maples. And both white oaks and hickories are known to contain greater amounts of caterpillar biomass than other tree species. And unfortunately, cerulean populations overall are declining at a rate of 3% per year due to habitat loss and habitat degradation. And they're also a state endangered species here in Indiana. Previous studies have focused on the nestlings diet and found that they primarily consume caterpillars in the families Nonodonidae and Noctuidae. And there have been two previous studies that have reported the gut contents of a small sample size of cerulean warblers, uh, specifically the adults, and they found wasps, beetles, homoptera, as well as moth adults and caterpillars. Cerulean warblers are also long distance migrants. They overwinter on the slopes of the Andes in South America, shown here in blue, and they migrate up to their breeding grounds in North America um, shown here in orange, including here in Indiana. Their breeding season occurs from early May to late June. And during their short breeding season, males maintain all purpose territories, meaning that they use these territories both for nesting and for foraging. And for many bird species, breeding ground arrival times are often synchronized with peak availability of their food source. However, there's evidence that cerulean warblers breeding ground arrival times may be mismatched with availability of their food source of caterpillars. Growing degree days use temperature to estimate arthropod and plant growth and development. And in the past 38 years, growing degree days in Indiana have advanced 14 days, but arrival times for cerulean warblers have only advanced one to four days. And elevated temperatures can cause caterpillars to hatch and develop earlier in the spring, which shortens that window of time when caterpillars are a food source for breeding birds. And long distance migrants that overwinter far from their breeding grounds, such as cerulean warblers, can't pick up on local environmental cues like temperature, which can lead to a mismatch of when they arrive on their breeding grounds and when caterpillars are actually available to them. The objectives of this portion of my thesis were to describe the diet of adult male cerulean warblers, compare the frequency of moths in the diet to the availability of moths in males' territories by breaking up the, the breeding season into early, mid, and late season, and to de determine if nest stages are synchronized with caterpillar abundance in southern Indiana. I conducted research in the hardwood ecosystem experiment in Yellowwood and Morgan Monroe State Forests in South Central Indiana. And I'll be speaking a little bit more about the HE later in my presentation. And I collected field samples uh, between May and July 2022 and again in 2023. 
I used point counts to locate males' territories, after which we lured males into mist nets using a playback of male song. All captured birds were placed into a one-time use paper lunch bag with a wax paper base, and that wax paper was there to prevent any liquid from the fecal sample from being absorbed by the bag. I used sterilized tweezers to collect any fecal matter found in the bag, and then placed it into a microcentrifuge tube with 100% ethanol, which was then placed into a freezer at negative 20 degrees Celsius. I sent all fecal samples to Northern Arizona University for metabarcoding analysis. And metabarcoding is a, te a technique that amplifies arthropod DNA as well as gut bacteria RNA to identify taxa that are present within the diet and the gut microbiome. In order to estimate caterpillar availability in males' territories, caterpillar frassfall, also known as caterpillar droppings, can be used as a reliable measurement of caterpillar abundance and illustrate caterpillar abundance over time. In order to collect frassfall, I demarcated males' territories using song perches. I then randomly selected important foraging trees within males' territories, such as oaks, hickories, and sugar maples and placed six grass traps per territory under these randomly selected trees. I then collected grass fall in three-day periods over the course of the breeding season. And any debris found in the grass was removed. I then dried it and then weighed it to the nearest 0.1 milligrams. We also searched for cerulean warbler nests throughout the breeding season, and we monitored all nests found uh, every two to three days in which we recorded the date as well as the nest stage. And nest stages included building, laying, incubating, feeding nestlings, as well as fledging. In total, we collected fecal samples from 53 adult male cerulean warblers, and shown is the proportion of fecal samples that contain each invertebrate order. And there were, top, there were two top uh, orders that were present within the fecal samples. Moths were present in 100% of samples, while arachnids were present in 90% of samples. And looking more closely at these top two orders, 16 moth families were detected within the diet, but the two most prominent families were Noctuidae and Tortricidae, the owlet moths and the leaf rollers. 10 arachnid families were detected in the diet, but there was one family that was more prominent than the others. Philodromidae, also known as the running crab spiders, was present in 62% of samples. This is an ordination plot showing moth composition in the diet by early, mid, and late breeding season. And to interpret this plot, we're looking at the degree of overlap between these eclipses that represent those three different time periods during the breeding season. And we can see that there's a lot of overlap uh, between these eclipses. I found a weak significant difference in moth composition in the diet um, based on those three time periods. However, caterpillar frass fall did differ significantly over the course of the breeding season. Those red vertical lines break up the data by early, mid, and late season. And caterpillar frass fall was greatest in mid to late May. And then we see this drop in caterpillar frass fall and the second smaller peak in caterpillar abundance in early June. And then by the time we reach the end of the breeding season, caterpillar availability is greatly reduced. And this suggests that cerulean warblers may be consuming a greater proportion of moths than what's available to them in their territories. Also due to the nature of metabarcoding, we don't know the life stage of the arthropods that were found within the diet. So cerulean warblers may be consuming adult moths when caterpillars are less abundant and may switch over to a greater proportion of caterpillars when they become more available in their uh, surrounding environments. Switching over to breeding phenology, this plot shows three different cerulean warbler nest stages from early May to late June. In orange is the building stage, which peaked in early May. In green is the incubation stage, which peaked in mid to late May. And in blue is the feeding stage, which peaked in early June. When I overlay caterpillar frass fall with these different nest stages, 
shown here at the purple dashed line, we can see that the nest stages and the frost fall are closely aligned. There is only a two day difference between that greatest peak in caterpillar frost fall and the peak in the incubation stage and a two day difference between that second smaller peak in caterpillar frost fall and a peak in the nestling feeding stage. And we would expect caterpillars to be in highest demand during these two stages. During this greatest peak in frost fall, many nests were in the incubation stage when females would need a lot of calcium to deposit into eggshells. And caterpillars are rich in nutrients, including calcium. During the second smaller peak in frost fall, many nests had nestlings, and nestlings need a lot of nutrients as well as fat content and calcium from caterpillars for bone growth and also rapid development as they prepare to leave the nest. This is a box plot showing caterpillar frost fall by tree species within males territories. Caterpillar frost fall was greatest in shagbark and pignut hickories followed by white oak, specifically Quercus alba, and sugar maples. But I didn't find a significant difference in frost fall between these tree species. I'm now gonna switch over to the second part of my presentation um, on my research on the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome consists of microorganisms that live within the digestive tract. And the gut microbiome can determine if a bird survives to the next breeding season. It can influence health and fitness and how well a bird absorbs nutrients from their diet. And the gut microbiome can be very rigid and be more closely related to bird species, or it can be fluid and change with the surrounding environment. Migration can influence the gut microbiome, especially as birds pick up transient microbes on stopover sites. Diet can also influence microbial composition. And previous studies have found that forest edge and fragmentation can reduce gut microbiome diversity and richness. And we currently don't have any knowledge of the cerulean warbler's gut microbiome. The understory of many forests in Indiana consists of dense sugar maples, which outcompete oak saplings. Civicultural management or timber harvest can be used to promote the regeneration of oaks and hickories and hardwood forests. And two management types include even aged and uneven aged management. Even aged management consists of shelter wood cuts, which remove mid and lower stories of the forest, as well as clear cuts and prescribed burns. Un uneven aged management consists of patch cuts, which are similar to clear cuts, but smaller in size and single tree selection, which helps shade tolerant species such as oaks reach maturity. As I mentioned before, we conducted research in the hardwood ecosystem experiment, which uses uneven aged and uneven aged management um, to manage those forests. And the hardwood ecosystem experiment is a 100 year experiment that was started in 2006 uh, that measures the impacts of forest management on plants and animals. And initial harvest cuts were completed in 2009. Second shelter wood cuts occurred in 2015. And from 2015 onward, prescribed burns have been implemented in even aged units. We surveyed nine study units overall. Three were even age managed, three were uneven age managed, and three were control units, which did not receive any kind of timber harvest or management. The objectives of this portion of my thesis were to determine if there was a correlation between the diet and the gut microbiome, and to evaluate the effect of civicultural management on the gut microbiome and diet composition of adult males. I used the Spearman's rank correlation test to determine if diet diversity influenced gut bacteria diversity. I didn't find a significant correlation between the diet and the gut microbiome. To test this further, I determined if bacteria composition changed by date during the breeding season, and I found a weak significant difference at the phylum level, but not at the class level. However, diet composition did change significantly over the course of the breeding season, which is another indication that the diet is not influencing the gut microbiome. 
shown is the relative frequency of occurrence of bacteria phylum found within each of the treatments. So we have control on the left, even aged in the middle, and uneven aged on the far right. And as you can see, there's not a lot of variation or differences in bacteria phylum between the different treatments. They're fairly similar. Proteobacteria was by far the most dominant uh, bacteria phylum found within the gut microbiome. And this is fairly consistent with previous studies. Proteobacteria is one of the main core bacteria phylum found within uh, songbirds' gut microbiomes. Looking at the diet, shown as the relative frequency of occurrence of arthropod families found for each of the treatments. And again, control is on the left. Even aged units are in the middle, and uneven aged or uneven aged units are on the far right. And we see a little bit more variation in the diet than we did for the gut microbiome. In the control units, more beetles and less moths were present within the diet. But what's actually happening is probably an effect of sample sizes. We had far less samples from the control units compared to the two treatments, just because we didn't have large enough populations to sample from. The majority of our birds were found in the even-aged and uneven-aged units compared to the controls. Looking at the two treatments, uh, even-aged had more wasps and also moths present compared to uneven-aged, but there wasn't a significant difference between the two treatments. In conclusion, adult male cerulean warblers primarily consume moths and spiders during the breeding season specifically leaf rollers, allet moths, and running crab spiders. Caterpillar abundance drastically changes in males' territories throughout the breeding season, but we don't see as definitive of a change in moth composition in the diet. Cerulean warbler nest stages in Indiana are currently synchronized with caterpillar abundance, but I didn't find a correlation between the diet and the gut microbiome. However, diet composition did change significantly with date during the breeding season, which again is another indication that the diet is not influencing the gut microbiome. And lastly, civicultural management does not currently alter the diet or the gut microbiome of cerulean warblers in southern Indiana. So why does this matter? By studying the diets of declining bird species, um, we can get a, a better idea of how arthropods are affecting um, their diets, and especially for monitoring uh, declining arthropods um, worldwide. Forest harvest treatments are also used to promote cerulean warbler habitats. Um, and Currently, or forest harvest, tre harvest treatments are currently not altering the gut microbiome or reducing gut microbiome diversity. And this is fantastic because it means by creating better, cerule cerule better quality cerulean warbler habitat on their breeding grounds, we're not reducing the gut microbiome, which can affect their survival. And the gut microbiome also appears to be very resistant to outside influences. Um, we see very little change or variation in the gut microbiome. And what's probably happening is cerulean warblers are picking up local microbiota on their breeding grounds um, during that first week of arrival, and we see very little change after that. The gut microbiome also is very sparse, with only seven main bacteria phylum that are found within the gut microbiome, compared to the diet where we see this array of arthropods that are present. My literature cited. I would like to thank all of the organizations that help fund my research, especially the Robert Cooper Audubon Society and the Foxes, as well as the Amos Butler Audubon Society um, for supporting my research, especially I would not be able to process as many samples as I did if, without their support. I would also like to thank my advisor, Dr. Islam, as well as everyone who helped collect this data, especially all of our field technicians and I will take any questions. Okay, yeah, so I'll be um, speaking about avian malaria and song performance of the cerulean warbler uh, in Southern Indiana. Um, and I'll just 
you know, mentioned that, of course, um, I was studying the same population of cerulean warblers that, that Britt was studying down there in southern Indiana. We were all working together there. And so um, keep that in mind as far as the locations and all that. Britt, uh, Britt did a great job uh, talking about some of the ecology of the species. <clears throat> so I'll go right into it. So avian malaria uh, is the first part. I'll, I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, and so the objectives were to survey prevalence, parasitemia in the populations and the intensity of the infections, um, provide the first genetic identifications of malaria lineages for cerulean warblers, um, and determine likely geographic regions of transmission for those lineages and um, possibly where cerulean warblers are being affected by those lineages. Um, and also to look for any effects of um, infection on health of individuals. And so avian malaria, um, you know, also known as hemosporidians, these are protists in the order Hemosporida that uh, commonly infect terrestrial birds around the world. Um, and it includes three main uh, genera, Plasmodium, Hemoproteus, and Leucocytozoon. And you might be familiar with Plasmodium because that's the one that's um, known as human malaria, but that's different, different species of Plasmodium. Um, the ones that infect birds are specific to birds. Um, and so this is a, a view of um, avian blood cells under a microscope here. Um, the nucleus is uh, in the blue there. And then um, I'm pointing to one of the cells here that's in, infected by um, avian malaria. And that's how it can be identified under a microscope. <clears throat> and so avian malaria, as I mentioned, is transmitted to birds by uh, biting insects like mosquitoes, much like it is uh, with humans. And the um, infects the um, tissue and the blood cells and gets transmitted back. And the, the three genera are transmitted by different types of insects. Um, the Hemoproteus only by the biting midges and Ceratophaganidae, and then the Leucocytosome only by black flies and Chimlysimulidae, actually. So, you know, whether or not those insects are present somewhere does have something to do with the transmission. But um, as we all know, mosquitoes are just about everywhere. So, um, so field work, you know, of course, um, we had to capture these cerulean warblers. So the same warblers are captured um, for a bird study. Um, we also took um, I took the blood samples from these birds, um, and, and so that's just, you know, a lot of great information that you can get from a population by banding and capturing them and, you know, safely releasing them. And so, um, you know, I took these very small blood samples and made blood smear slides and then also collected the whole blood and stored it in ethanol for the molecular work that I'll be talking about. Um, and so the sample size for the blood samples was for males, 49, and two females, and, and that's an adult female right there. And again, they're just very difficult to capture because they don't respond to the um, the song playback that we use to routinely capture territorial male songbirds, and that's, um, that's the standard practice. Uh, and here's an example of some um, color bands on an individual. This is how we identify the individuals, which is uh, somewhat important for both of our studies. Um, and so it has the, the metal band from the government there with the USGS, the nine digits on it, and then the unique combination of three colors. And so, um, you know, the first step is to identify these infections by microscope. And so I did that under 1,000 times um, oil immersion, 20 minutes uh, each. And if the individual did have infected cells, or um, you know, this is what it would look like. And then for the individuals that were infected, I could quantify the infection intensity uh, under the microscope by counting the number of cells per um, an estimated 10,000 blood cells uh, or more in some cases. <clears throat> and so basically the results of that, of the parasitemia, I'll just mention that now, they were um, for the most part very low uh, parasitemia. And so as low as one in 20,000 cells infected, um, maximum of 2.8%, which is fairly high um, for us, for other species too. Um, that's maybe 280 infected cells per 10,000. Uh, but again, most of them very low level. Um, here's another photo of a blood smear slide. But um, yeah, so again, I took the whole blood samples and stored those and, and so the next uh, important part was to uh, sequence the DNA from those parasites from the blood. And so I amplified it with PCR, preliminary chain reaction. I'm not gonna go into the details of that too much here, but um, then they were, it was sequenced, the Sanger sequencing. So you get this um, 480 base pair, we call it, you know, all those nucleotides that are in a strand of DNA. 
um, of the G's, C's, um, T's, and A's, and um, unique, you have unique combinations of those that uh, identify a lineage. And so a lineage is is basically um, what we use to define species in, in the avian hem, uh, um literature, although it, it's, it is at least as specific as species, if not more specific in a lot of cases, just because we don't know, understand the taxonomy so well. And um, so some of these lineages are pretty closely related to each other. Um, you know, if you look at the whole diversity of the um, avian malaria, whereas some of them are, um, might only be a few base pairs different, but they're considered pretty um, pretty well separated. And it's also combined with morphological studies under the microscope in some cases, um, although our knowledge of that is somewhat limited. <clears throat> And so, you know, after, you know, surveying for the infections by PCR and, and microscope, um, I was able to determine the, the prevalence of these infections of the population. And, and for all the birds that I, um, you know, screened with both of those methods, both of those methods matched up just, just right. Um, you know, the ones that were infected by PCR, I was able to find infected blood cells in those individuals. And so, um, you know, here's our sample sizes, and basically 31% in both years. There's statistically no difference in prevalence between age class or study year. So then I could um, combine them all together um, for that 31.4% prevalence, which um, ends up being pretty moderate uh, as compared to there were two previous studies of cerulean warblers, uh, avian hemospertians, but uh, those were only using the microscope. They didn't identify uh, the lineages. So earlier studies, but um, yeah, so the 31% is moderate, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. Um, and that's pretty typical for a lot of species of songbirds. Um, and so out of those, like I said, uh, there were 16 infected individuals, including one female bird, and um, there were 11 unique lineages, which is um, a fair amount of diversity for just one study of one species. Um, as compared to some other studies, um, migratory songbirds. And so four hemoproteus, seven plasmodium, and two of these were novel, so not previously described lineages of um, avian hemospertians, which again is, is fairly typical for um, studies, especially when sampling from species that haven't been sampled from before. A lot of studies will find novel lineages. Um, <clears throat> And so the results, um, again, I'll be talking, I have, there's a, a database that catalogs all of the records of all, all these um, individuals that were infected by avian malaria and all these studies. Um, and I'll be depositing all that information there for use in future research as well. But, um, you know, so it records where the uh, studies took place and which uh, species and so on. And there's many thousands of records in there. Um, and I was able to sort through those and filter down to the lineages that were found in the cerulean warblers. And, you know, from that, um, for at least for the lineages that had a good number of records, um, I was able to um, make some inferences about where these lineages are being transmitted uh, where, you know, to migratory birds in general and uh, specifically, to, specifically to cerulean warblers. Um, and so these are the ones that I was able to determine likely transmission areas for for cerulean warblers and um so basically eastern north america and northern south america so their breeding and their wintering range you might be familiar with this map from brit's presentation there so breeding range in the orange and the wintering range down there in the andes in blue um, one of those lineages didn't have quite enough records to make a determination for cer certain but um very possible that it's transmitted in northern south america based on the records And so the results, um, you know, the effects on, on health, uh, you know, just compared the body mass between the infected and the uninfected because uh, there was no difference uh, between age, class, or year uh, in infection either. And like, much like the prevalence, I was able to pull those together and just compare the uninfected and infected. And, um, you know, according to a two sample t-test for the, the two samples there, uh, the infected individuals had a higher body mass, um, which was actually contrary to my predictions that they, um, you know, hypothesis they would have lower um, body mass. But 
looking back at the literature, really a lot of studies don't find much difference, if any. And there were some studies for populations of songbirds re reporting these um, infected individuals having higher body mass. And really the best um, biological explanation for that, um, you know, if this is a true pattern in the population, uh, is that the um, infected ones with the lower body mass or lower condition, as you can see here, they're kind of missing from that, that below, the, below the average distribution there. Um, those individuals perhaps did not survive um, is, is possible. So it's, it's possible we're seeing a bit of a survivorship bias in the, in the population here would be the more interesting of the um, biological explanations and, and one that's, that has some support. Um, a lot of cases, there are there's some other studies of birds in um, the, you know, on their wintering grounds, such as in the, the Caribbean, where very few infected birds are found. And uh, some of the authors propose that as an explanation that, you know, perhaps the infected ones aren't surviving to midwinter there, you know. But again, they, they in those studies, they couldn't even really make a, you know, a certain determination about what's going on. So that is a possibility. And so yeah, that's um, that's that for that chapter. And I'll, I'll recap that at the end of uh, the, the next section here. And so, as I mentioned, it's avian malaria and song performance. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, for one, test for song performance trade-offs specific to cerulean warblers, a little bit of basic biology here, understand something about song performance, but then also see if it's related to the, um, the malaria infections or body condition. And so, you know, bird song, we, we're all familiar with that here. We're all birders, but um, I'll just review some of the, you know, functions of, of bird song, at least in Cerulean warbler is another um, North American breeding songbirds. Um, it's used to attract mates, maintain pair bonds, defend territories. And so the, the receiver of the song might be the female bird, or it might be another male bird that's uh, competing with the cerulean warbler. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, in order to do this, you know, we had all those color banded birds out there in the population. And so I was able to um, follow them around and record them in the forest and their you know, just natural uh, performances of song from them without any uh, stimulation from playback or anything like that. Um, so that was important to uh, get a representative sample of what their songs are. And as Bert mentioned, we, you know, monitor the nests and, um, you know, find the territories of these birds. So that's what helps in doing that. But all, for the most part, I recorded the birds after I banded them so that way I could know exactly which individual was being uh, recorded. So what is song performance, right? So it's the ability to perform challenging aspects of song. And particularly uh, things that are physically or neurologically challenging. And so some of those things might be high trill rate, long duration, uh, wide frequency bandwidth, high amplitude, rapid uh, frequency modulation, and consistency. Um, so these are some things that have been studied uh, in regard to song performance. And the important thing is that these um, aspects of song relate to physical limitations. Um, and so respiratory capacity, you know, how much, you know, capacity they have in their lungs to produce a vo single vocalization, syringeal muscle speed, um, you know, their vocal cords basically, and uh, abdominal muscle strength, ability to exert the air out, and then general motor control of their bill or their syrinx and a number of things. And for these, the vocalizations that I'm studying, um, as I'll be illustrating here, the uh, the buzzes there at the end of the cerulean warbler song, and I'll show the, the spectrograms in a minute here. But the um, those vocalizations are we know how those are produced. That's well known that uh, those types of high trill rate vocalizations are produced in a single breath. Um, so that that tells us a little bit about the constraints on on, on these things. <clears throat> And so, um, you know, with all that information, we know that perhaps uh, song performance can honest can be an honest signal of the the quality of an individual. It represents their ability to perform challenging motor feats and respiratory capacity and um, such. And so, song performance um, has been correlated with female preference, extra pair paternity success, 
male provisioning rates, reproductive success, body mass, parasitemia of avian malaria in uh, one study recently, and then also can affect territorial responses and be related to age. Um, and so these are some of the examples of some of the species in which these questions have been tested and found um, canaries, swamp sparrows, chestnut-sided warblers, red-winged blackbirds, um, some of them more than others. But um, yeah, and so this, and then it comes down to, you know, how do you actually measure that per, that performance data? How do you judge that? You know, it has to be a quantitative way to do that. And so basically the, you know, the birds, they, they're they limited in, in how, you know, the, their frequency bandwidth, you know, how, how wide of a range of pitches they can sing while simultaneously trying to um, repeat those notes very rapidly. Um, so this is one of the song performance metrics that's been studied in the literature the most known as vocal deviation. And so it's, um, you know, it's the trade-off between frequency bandwidth and trill rate, basically. And this is what it would look like if you plotted a bunch of, um, you know, maybe 200 or so songs of uh, species you know, based on those measurements. And so the distance from that upper limit is uh, equal to the song performance of the individual. Um, but some other uh, studies have, have used some, some other measurements of um, song measurements as well. And I'll be speaking about that briefly. So, you know, finally, of course, we have this really warbler song here. And that red line shows you the uh, ending part there. So that's the buzz in the Cerulean Warbler song. And that's the part that I measured for song performance because it's standard across all individuals. All, all Pretty much all the songs of Cerulean Warblers include that buzz. So it must have some uh, importance there. Whereas the the beginning part of the song here, these, uh, these two uh, distinct sections before that are quite variable. And that's what constitutes different song types of individuals. Um, that's how it's been defined in the literature and, and as you'll see, it makes sounds. So if you can hear that, that's the song. You're looking for where it changes to the buzz. And so again, that's the duration. Um, that's one of the things I was measuring. And the bandwidth, frequency bandwidth is, is on that axis because the spectrogram is, you know, on the on the left to right here on the x-axis, it's showing time and then um, up and down here it's, it's showing the frequency from low to high pitch and then above there in the blue that's a, a waveform view so that's just the amplitude um, of the song in time series and so that can be used to measure some things as well and make selections of the songs so here's another uh, variation of this really warbler song listen to this see how it sounds a little bit different So, so yeah, they're different in, the, in that uh, respect, but they're, the buzz section is fundamentally the same. We know that it's produced in the same way, so it might be subject to the same limitations uh, between individuals. And so there's two different song types, as I mentioned, and here it is zoomed in. That's the part that we use to define the song types. So you can see the difference in the spectrograms. And so, you know, I plotted all those, um, you know, the various measurements, uh, you know, frequency bandwidth and trill rate, and then, uh, you know, frequency bandwidth and trill duration, trill, and then uh, basically every combination of those three measurements, so bandwidth, duration, and trill rate, to look for, um, see if there are any trade-offs that followed those, um, you know, principles, as I mentioned, for measuring song performance. And so I, I plotted it, um, I, you know, so this is the regression of the upper regression of frequency bandwidth against trill duration, and then also trill duration against bandwidth in the in the red there. So that's if you were basically flip it around on the graph there, and so that just more um, accurately measures based on some new, newer methods in the field. And um, as you can see here, the the skew of the performance scores they all do they do tend it, it skews towards um, you know higher scores. So that, that means that all the individuals are trying to maximize this element of performance. That's the evidence of that. So it, whereas if we were to see all of the you know, scores all clustered 
further away from those limits, then it wouldn't be very good evidence that this is a real you know, measure of um, performance. And then we looked at how repeatable these metrics are by individual versus song type. And so um, they are very repeatable by individual, um, meaning that the songs of one individual are more similar to itself than others. And, um, but then when we look at the song types, so the, there's really a ton of overlap here. So that means basically that the song type doesn't define the song performance. So it's not just a um, artifact of, you know, how the song was learned and the type of song it learned. And those are the averages of individuals there. You can see them all plotted on the, the space there. So they're all varying distances away from those limits. And so basically, um, you know, I modeled uh, the song performance as a function of, you know, it either, you know, infected or not infected or the level of infection. And then also um, consider the variables of, you know, body condition, age, size of the bird, the bird's head, um, and then the ordinal date. So basically the calendar date from one to 365, um, because those things are all known to possibly affect song of birds. And there was no, no effects here. Um, that's parasitemia, that's infection status, pretty much the same. Um, and then body condition residuals, uh, no, no relationship there, no significant relationship, so. Yeah, so um, I'll just go ahead and conclude that. And we have 30% uh, of the birds are infected with malaria, high diversity of lineages, Lineages are likely transmitted in North America, South America, and possibly Central America. Um, and then uh, less fit individuals possibly might not survive with malaria. Um, and then I was able to measure song performance of those buzzes. Um, and you know, it has some you know, individual significance there, but um, it was not evidently influenced by body condition or avian malaria in any way, which is maybe consistent with the fact that these individuals that are surviving in the population with malaria have low level infections and perhaps they're um, doing well with the uh, able able to cope with those infections. So. Um, and so just kind of stepping back here, you know, this is I'll mention this is the first study to document avian malaria lineages for cerulean warblers. This is new information where cerulean warblers are infected also, and potential um, information about how um, Malaria might negatively affect survival of birds, generally, and, and cerulean warblers. And then, uh, you know, this first study to test for and describe a song performance trade-off specific to those types of vocalizations, actually, despite it being uh, long acknowledged in the literature as being different from the other types of trills. Um, and then, you know, so basic, some other basic biology about song performance and potentially, uh, you know, uh, further study could uh, use that to to see how it's relevant to communication. So. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, again the um, Amos Butler Audubon Society and our Robert Cooper Audubon Society here, um, which provided um, really significant support for uh, this project and uh, allowed me to to do this research, uh, as well as uh, other partners in the Department of Natural Resources and the Indiana Academy of Science as well, um, Ball State University Aspire Grant. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Islam, allowed me for Horney, our field technicians, and then a number of other folks, mainly here at uh, Ball, Ball State University. So yeah, with that, I'll, I'll be, I'd be happy to take any questions as well. So, thank you. Thank you.